please welcome the incredible Andrew Ryan! Yes. Hello, Belfast. How are you? Thank you so much for coming out. Fair play to you. I do appreciate it. It's good to be here in Belfast filming this tonight in front of a lovely select crowd. Uh, there were still tickets available last week, but anyway, that's another story. I think relationships are very difficult for me. You know, I've been in failed relationship after failed relationship. Like, I'm beginning to think it's them. You know, it's mad though, isn't it? Like, relationships are difficult, you know? And I decided, like, what I was going to do, I was going to, like, you know, become a little bit better. Because me and my last girlfriend, we broke up because I cheated. Yeah, I cheated, yeah, yeah. You know, I went three episodes ahead of her on Peaky Blinders, right? And she went fucking mental at me. She was like, well, 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 we've seen the real you now, haven't we, huh? If you can cheat on me in Netflix, what's stopping you from cheating on me in real life? I was like, fucking nothing, right? Because you're wrecking me head. Because we did the pandemic together and I couldn't cope with it, lads. Do you remember when the government said you need to stay in for six weeks? I was like, no, no, I'm, I'm grand. I'll, I'm, I'll, I'll pass that. I won't be doing that now because she's in there, like, right? And she hates me. You might even do this tomorrow. You, don't, you might have done it yesterday. You might have even done it today. Do you ever sit at home on one sofa and your partner's on the other sofa and you get to the point in the relationship where you just look at them? You just look at them and you're like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> Why are you in my house? I used to get dressed up for this. What's the scratching about? Why are you chewing? What's that about? Do you ever look at your partner one particular day? Just look at them. And you just look at them and you go, no. And then in the back of your head you go, I hope you get fucking COVID. Like, you know what I mean? So you have to self-isolate for two weeks in the spare room and I will feed you through the door like the animal that you are. What's that, you want dominoes and Ben and Jerry's? Here's a cracker bread and tomato, now shut up. If you come out of that room, I'm gonna track and trace your ass. The thing about it is, is my ex-girlfriend, she was lovely, she was an amazing girl, right? And uh, she was Indian, right, really, really lovely girl. And when we broke up, right, when I got the email with the feedback, um, <laughs> and she CC'd her mum in it as well, you know, like, she said to me, like one of the things she said to me, Andrew, you were always there, you were always there, but you were never present. <laughs> well, I'm here now, like, I mean, I'm reading the thing. And then she said, I don't think you've got the self-esteem for me. I was like, you're right. I can't cope with you. You're an international woman. I'm a man that likes to live alone and pay money to a gym and don't go. You know, that's who I am. Right, right. And it got me thinking the last few years with everything that had gone on, you spend a lot of time about thinking about your own life, don't you? And I would say, guys, I probably live my life 40% of the time with low self-esteem. Give me a cheer if you've got low self-esteem. Yeah, loads of you. Right, brilliant. The rest of you probably didn't have the confidence there, okay? <laughs> the thing about having low self-esteem, though, is I trust myself. Do you know what I mean? I fucking trust myself, guys. I trust myself. Like, I've seen the worst of me. You know, I know what it's like to have low self-esteem. You overcompensate, you overanalyze, you become a little bit of a people pleaser. You know, I've seen the worst of my behaviors. You know, I won't kill again. But like, I have seen, you know, I have seen it. Like, like I know how to react in certain situations. Like, for example, like if I sent a woman 44 text messages <laughs> and she didn't reply, I know she wants me to ring her. That's what women want, isn't it? A bit of verbal, isn't it? A bit of verbal. I don't think I had the self-esteem to be in relationships sometimes, you know, because I probably spent a lot of my life being a bit of a people pleaser, you know? And it's kind of crazy, isn't it, when you, when you look back? And I think the pandemic was really good for me to kind of, like, learn a little bit, you know? And I remember, like, the day we actually broke up, we were walking down the street, we were holding hands, right? And uh, we were just on the way to the argument. <laughs> and, um, and because like she's Indian and I'm Irish, so she's brown skin and I'm Irish, we were walking down the street holding hands in Cork and she thought it would be hilarious. As we we're walking down the street, she just went, he's trafficking me! <laughs> and everybody looked at me. And I reacted in the most Irish way possible. Will you just fucking shut up? Which in hindsight is not the best reaction. 
if you're ever accused of people trafficking, trying to cover up what you've been accused of. It's hard. Being here, because the older I'm getting, like, I'm trying to become a bit better to myself, you know. Failed relationships, live alone, it's just mental. And I feel now I've got hold of all of it, you know. And what I did was I started reading self-help books. Oh my good Jesus, right? Read this one. I can change your life in seven days. Took me two weeks to read it. <laughs> There's a guy in England, right, called Paul McKenna, and he writes all these books on confidence, right? He's absolutely nuts, right? He wrote four books on confidence, and this is the title of the books in the order that they were released, right? The first book is, I can give you total flying confidence. The second book is, I can give you instant confidence. The third book is, I can give you supreme self-confidence. And the last book he wrote was, his latest one is, I can give you confidence. <laughs> Does anyone believe he's losing confidence? in the type of confidence that he's actually offering people. <laughs> I started reading all these books, right? I read this book, I thought, this time now, not working, I'm at home, I'm gonna spend time investing in my thumb, my new me, hashtag live, laugh, love, <laughs> reading self help. And I read this book and it changed my life. It's called The Chimp Paradox. I don't know if you've read it, The Chimp Paradox. The Chimp Paradox is a great book because it teaches you about the voices in your head. There's voices in your head now, right? And this book teaches you that there's two voices in your head. Now, I thought I'd more, right? There's, there's the human voice, and then there's the chimp. Now, the chimp is the fucking, the fucking angry man, the impatient, the fucking Jesus Christ, you know, like the impulsive, the reactionary, the man that doesn't think long term, he thinks instantly, he craves just instant decisions, you know, like if there was a Mars bar and a glass of water in front of me, the chimp wins, just get the Mars, boom. That's the way it is, right? That's the chimp. The chimp has been controlling me for most of my life, right? And then there's the human voice, which is the patient, long-term strategy. You know, don't worry about this, think long-term, make sensible decisions, all that kind of stuff, right? And I read the book, and now, after reading the book, you've got to get the balance between the chimp and the human. If I'm a bit peckish, and there's a glass of water and a Mars bar in front of me, and after reading that book, I now have the water straight after I've eaten the Mars, right? <laughs> the biggest load of shit I've ever read in my entire life, right? Oh my God, I tried it one day, right? It happened to me, I was flying Belfast, London, over and back on the same day, I had to go for a meeting. Checked in, Aer Lingus, outbound and return. Walked onto the flight, I'm saying I'm sitting on like, you know, a 4C, right, on the aisle. I walk in and as I walk up, there's a guy sitting on 4C, but 4B is empty. Now my chimp wakes up, right? And he's like, fucking kill him. Like, you know? <laughs> This guy's sitting in your seat, he's in solid your family. Right, go for him. He's sitting in your seat, he's taking something off you. Why you don't even know this guy? He's already bullying you, he's bullying you, right? <laughs> my, my human is like, it's okay, Andrew, don't worry about it. These things happen, he's probably just sitting in the wrong seat. Oh my God, right? So I go up to him, I take out my boarding card and I go, how you doing, mate? You all right? Yeah, I'm uh, 4C. And he's looked to me. And instead of him getting up and moving into the middle seat, do you know what he did? He got up, moved out to the aisle to try and usher me into the middle seat. And my chimp, mate, This plane's going down. <laughs> My human's like, ignore him, Andrew. Just sit in the middle seat. It's a one-hour flight. What could possibly go wrong? There's no confrontation. We need to take long-term strategy. You're going for a meeting. You don't want to turn up after being beaten up or in a plane crash or anything like that. Just go sit in the middle. Be angry inside. Be angry inside. Be angry inside. Release that anger on somebody. Be angry inside, but not the guy next to you, right? Cabin crew come over. and like, what's the problem? And I goes, I'm actually sitting in this one. I just mind. She goes, yes, you are. But that's your return flight tonight. <laughs> I was sitting in 21B. <laughs> My chimp is like, <laughs> not to do with me, mate, nothing to do with me at all. You made a massive fucking mistake. <laughs> My human's like, don't worry, Andrew, don't worry, you're gonna be, I had to go, sorry about that, made him walk all the way back to the end of the plane. Looked at the wrong boarding card. And even when you try to become like better as a person, it's very hard, because the older I'm getting, lads, I'm telling you, lads, I don't know what's going on, but, I, I kill a lot of people in my head. Like, <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever kill people in your head? Just fucking killing people. If you're sitting there and you're going, I don't kill people in my head, you're the people we're fucking killing, right? <laughs> you know, small things. You'd be driving, you get to the traffic lights, the light goes green, the car in front of you doesn't go, and you're like, come on! I'm gonna kill you and your kids, drive the car you paid for, fuck, come on! Like, the only difference between me and Ted Bundy was Ted Bundy had self-belief, right? That's all it is. <laughs> You're lucky I have no confidence, lads. I'd have taken out the whole of Andy Town by now, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> that bit won't make it in. 
I live in East Belfast. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Because I didn't do any fucking research, right? <laughs> what a place, ladies and gentlemen. I live in a unionist housing estate. Oh my good Jesus, pray for the souls that are forgotten, right? And I absolutely love it. It is amazing. I'm the only Southern Irish guy living in the estate. How do I know that? Because they keep fecking reminding me, right? My neighbors have got a WhatsApp group about me. It's called, what the hell is that Fenian doing here? Like, you know what I mean? I love it, man. It's great crack. I, my next door neighbor, William, he's a great guy, right? He's, he's in a band, right? And um, he plays the drums, you know? And uh, yeah, he's out the back practice. He's always out the back practice. Like that. Like, he's got one gig a year. Um, I must go see him live, you know? I must go see him live. I guess the 12th of July he said it was on this year. I'm not sure. Big gig, he said. Big gig. He's a lovely guy, man. I really like him. And uh, he kind of looks after me, you know? He kind of, like, looks after me. I remember one day I was outside the house, and obviously it's predominantly a unionist area. British people, lovely, absolutely polite, absolutely great, you know? And I'm outside the house one day. I'm just doing a bit of painting, right? I'm just finishing off my Bobby Sands memorial, right? <laughs> And William comes up to me and he goes, Andrew, can I just ask you, what made you come here? I said, I'm actually part of the Sinn Féin relook. Fuck's sake. Right on the punchline. Oh, you bastard. I'm doing that joke. This is one of the best jokes in the fucking show. I'm doing it again. And I tell you something, you're going to go wild. I've killed you in my head. I'm doing the whole thing again, and I tell you something, you better fucking cop on now. I will not let this, it's cost me a lot of money to do this. I'm not having some fucker from Ballymena or something. Gal Gorham's a good spot. Right. It's coming again. Laugh! Fuck the record. Turn the cameras off, Aaron. <laughs> Fuck them off, man. We're filming in Cork next week. Fuck it. <laughs> so I'm doing the whole thing again now. Like this is going up on Instagram. <laughs> Careful with your glasses now, everyone, right? I'm outside the house one day, right? <laughs> uh, uh. I was outside the house one day, right? I was doing a bit of painting, right? I was just finishing off me Bobby Sands memorial, right? My next door neighbour, William, came over and he goes, Andrew, can I just ask you, what made you move here? I said, I'm actually part of the Sinn Féin relocation scheme. Do you know what I mean, right? Yeah. See, what happens is Mary Lou MacDonald down south picks a load of southerners. She just places us up here, you know what I mean? So when there's the next election on, you know what's going to happen, right? Since I moved to, to the north, I moved to Belfast, I, I got myself a Northern Irish GP. Lance. And I love my GP in Belfast. He's absolutely brilliant. But the issue isn't the GP. The issue is these evil fucking witches on the reception desk. <laughs> right? These fucking whore bags who have never had a good dick in their life, right? Do you know what? It is easier to get an appointment with the head of ISIS than it is my GP. <laughs> Ringing them up in the morning, I swear to God, are you feeling bad then? You have to wake up, you've got to write, I know what they're like in the front line of Ukraine, because I'm fucking feeling it here. <laughs> you ring up and you go, hiya, can I get an appointment? What's it concerning? <laughs> I said, it's concerning me health. <laughs> I haven't rang up to cancel the sky. What's the problem, Andrew? 
I said, I can't sleep. Sure, none of us are sleeping at the moment, Andrew. <laughs> Have you thought about lying on the bed, closing your eyes and waiting a while? <laughs> oh, thanks very much for the tip. I really appreciate that. I said, we'll get the doctor to give you a call back. What's the best time to call you? I said, between 2 a.m. <laughs> and 6 a.m. Well, we're not open, Andrew. Well, guess who's awake? <laughs> you never see a male doctor receptionist, do you? Where's the gender balance in that job? It's always women. You never see a male. Do you know why? Because men have empathy. <laughs> yeah. I rang up and a bloke answers the phone. I was like, oh, yeah, I can't sleep. He's like, it's all right, come down, let's play FIFA. You know what I mean? <laughs> let's go Helen's Bay for a swim. And I've always had problems with my stomach and stuff like that. And I remember one day, uh, when I was living over in England, I, had a, I, went to, I woke up one morning, I was really sick, right? I was dying. Like, did you ever duck be dying? Did you ever wake up and you're just fucking dying? <laughs> so I went down to my English GP, who I never trusted. He was a lovely fella. Really, had a really nice uh, English GP. Never trusted him because he never wore a belt at work. Do you know the kind of way? I never trust anyone that doesn't wear a belt at work. Do you know the kind of way? Like, just look at him, oh, fully dressed, but not the belt. There's something going on there. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wouldn't be if I saw him on a panorama investigates in five years, you were like, I fucking saw that coming now. <laughs> that fellow wasn't right in the head, like, he didn't wear a belt, like, you know? So I walk in and the doctor looks at me and he goes, sit down. He counts 12 ulcers in my mouth. He goes, Andrew, these are the worst case of ulcers I've ever seen in my life. I went, Jesus Christ. He goes, no, I think he'd only been a GP a week, right? <laughs> he goes, but what we're going to do is we're going to send you for a blood test to find out what's going on in your body. I was like, okay, right. So I went, did the blood test, failed it. <laughs> Fa <laughs> How do you fail a blood test? I was like, what came out, milk? I don't understand. Calls me back into the office. He goes, right, Andrew, we've got to do further tests. I was like, brilliant, more, more stuff, right. He goes, we're going to send you for a, a biopsy thing. I said, what's that? He says, we're going to get a camera. We're going to stick it down the front of your, your throat. We'll get another one up there, right? We're going to floss you, right? That's what we're going to do, right? I thought, oh, Jesus, right? He said, but what I want you to do is, I have a sneaky feeling you could potentially be celiac or something. I said, no, I'm grand. I don't need that now, right? I have enough things going on, right? He says, but I want you to try for your gut and your stomach and all that. He said, I want you to eat gluten-free food. I was like, right, what's that? And he goes, you know, no wheat, no barley, no rye, gluten-free bread, gluten-free pasta, all that kind of stuff. I said, right. And then because he was English and I was Irish, he thought it would be hilarious to lean in and go, no, you know what that means now, Andrew, don't you? Huh? He goes, what? He goes, no more Guinness for you. I said, and what will happen if I do drink Guinness? He goes, you could have a gluten attack. I said, I'll be honest with you, doctor. After a few pints, I'm up for a fight anyway, right? <laughs> Couldn't believe it. Got out of the GP surgery, rang my brother in Cork. I said, listen, you're not going to believe this, right? Went for a blood test, failed it. Right, they're sending me for an autopsy. Right? <laughs> Apparently I'm dead inside or something, I don't know. I said, are you sitting down for the next bit? You're not going to believe the next bit. You're sitting down. You know what he's after? The English GP, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, can't drink Guinness anymore. And my brother said, has he mentioned Murphy's or Beamish? <laughs> So I decided I would go gluten-free, right? Day one of gluten-free, I walked into my local Sainsbury's. I was like, hello! Hello, I'm different! Where is the gluten-free aisle? The gluten-free aisle? And this woman said, aisle? You think you people have an aisle? You mean the shelf, right? I said, yeah, where's the gluten-free shelf? The gluten-free shelf in my local Sainsbury's was just after the pharmacy department and the alcohol section, right? What Sainsbury's are saying is you can end your life here if you want, okay, right? Oh, my good Jesus, pray for the souls that have forgotten, right? Have you ever had gluten-free food? Jesus Christ, right? It is the most disgusting piece of crap I've ever had. Have you ever had a gluten-free pizza? The base of the pizza is like 1950s wallpaper, right? The tomato sauce on the pizza is the blood of a dead celiac, right? <laughs> who's died from the sheer boredom of their own bloody diet, right? I couldn't believe it, right? But then it got me thinking about gluten. Can you imagine dying from gluten? The shame, like. The shame on the family. To die from gluten. The embarrassment. If you think about it, nobody's running a marathon if you die from gluten. I'm running the London Marathon for who? My friend, gluten. No chance. Can you imagine people coming to your funeral and your family trying to explain to them how you died? 
Andrew was a lovely fella. How was he taken away from us? A slice of white bread got him in the end. The house was wall to wall covered in toast. Sure he never stood a chance. I do love it though. Like I do love living in Belfast, man, and it's great, you know. Like when I was here during the pandemic, obviously I was getting some money off the, the British government. Jesus, it felt great, lads. And uh, brilliant, like. I was down in Cork and they were paying it into me English account. Fucking brilliant. Jeez, if Michael Collins could see me now. Like. Had to get a job, lads. Had to get a job in the pandemic because this is my job. I had to get a job. Now, I left school with nothing. No third level. Didn't do very well in my leave insert. It was so bad. I said to my teacher, I said, should I repeat my exams? And he said, Andrew, you're too far gone now. <laughs> Go to the wild, my child. Go to the wild. <laughs> During the pandemic, I had to apply for jobs, right? I applied for a job working in the men's retail store next. <laughs> Two days before my job interview working in the men's retail store Next, I realised I didn't even own a shirt and tie for the interview in Next. So I went into Next to buy a shirt and tie in Next for my job interview in Next, right? Let me tell you this, Belfast, here's a bit of a tip. Don't ever turn up to a job interview already dressed in the uniform of the company that you want to get a job in, right? If you went for a job in the PSNI and you turned up for the interview head to toe in a police officer's uniform, right? They're like, you want to be a police officer? You're like, well, I already am, <laughs> you know? You're not getting the job, okay? I got a job, stacking shelves, B&Q, £8.90 an hour, and I absolutely loved it. It was a great job, really, really enjoyed it. £8.90 an hour, stacking shelves in B&Q. And what I learned during that time that there was two pandemics, right? It was the pandemic of the COVID, and there's the pandemic of the stupid members of the fucking public, right? <laughs> the shit you have to put up with on minimum wage. Oh my God. What I learned on minimum wage, stacking shelves during the pandemic, dealing with the general public in B&Q was COVID hasn't fucking killed enough. <laughs> right, I'll tell you that. <laughs> the dumb questions you get asked in customer service. Customers come up to go, excuse me, mate, where's aisle 11? I said it's between 10 and 12. Where did you think it was going to be, right? People coming up to the till, do you take cash or cards? No, we take a bottle of Coke and a small child. Like, <laughs> one customer came up to me, he was like, excuse me, mate, excuse me, uh, toilets, toilets? I said, uh, do you want to use a toilet? <laughs> or do you want to buy a toilet? He was like, why would I want to buy a toilet? Because we sell fucking toilets. <laughs> You're in B&Q. My uniform in B&Q, right? Orange apron, classic East Belfast, right? Here we go, right? <laughs> Customer advisor, one to six months. B&Q face mask, B&Q app, B&Q jumper, B&Q black trousers, B&Q. Yellow high-vis jacket, written on the back, happy to help. I wasn't. I was not happy to help. I'm on £8.90 an hour. You're lucky I turned up to the place, right? I'm on aisle 14, right? It's between 13 and 15, right? That's where I am. Weapons aisle, hammers, spanners, the whole lot, tools. All the high value goods that people need, right? I'm standing there, this guy just walks straight in, he goes, excuse me mate, looks me up and down and went, uh, do you work here? <laughs> no, I've just turned up to be job interview, like what do you think? <laughs> this isn't some sort of kinky fetish, like, on Thursdays I don't get dressed up as a Tesco employee, go down to Tesco, stand next to the cold meats and be like, oh Jesus Christ, I love a leg of lamb me now, wouldn't I, huh? But people think that if you're on minimum wage that you're like useless, you're not. Some of the smartest people I've ever worked with, I've only ever done minimum wage jobs since I left school. That's all I've ever done, right? And I love it and I'll happily go back and do it again. There's no problem, it's good, honest living, right? And I remember one day I was in there and people think you're tick just because you're on minimum wage, they can speak to you any way you want. This fella walks in, I'll never forget it. He comes in, doesn't say hello, doesn't ask me a question, just makes a statement, right? Just walks in, straight up to me and he went, I want to hang a mirror. Oh, well, if I can hang it then. <laughs> you don't need to come into B&Q and get permission <laughs> to hang a mirror. So I thought I'd offer him a little bit of customer service. I said, what type of mirror is it? In my head thinking, is it a bathroom mirror or is it a hallway mirror? And he just went, oh, you know, it's the ones you look into. <laughs> no, I get the fuck out of the shop. 
I remember my favourite place I've ever worked when I was growing up was a hotel in Cork called the Maryborough House Hotel. Really nice hotel, really, really great place to work. And I worked there in the summers and stuff. And the problem with the hotel was whenever there was guests in there, <laughs> that was just the problem, right? When there was no guests, it was great crack, right? But I was a waiter and I was a porter, but I was a very bad waiter. I had no patience for the people. I was killing them in my head all the time. Right? Was... But I'll never forget at this day, ladies and gentlemen, this woman came in and I think about her every couple of weeks. Do you ever meet someone and you just think about them? It happened so many years ago, but I wonder if she's still alive. Did she take the vaccine? You know, I'm just wondering why. Because you'll figure out why. And I'm there and I'm a waiter one day. She comes up and she has the food menu in her hand. And she sees me and she's beelining for me like... And she comes up and she goes, excuse me, I just want to ask you a question. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Do you want a bit? <sighs> excuse me, can I just ask you a question about one of the desserts? I'm like, yeah, yeah, go on, yeah, hurry up, yeah, go on. She goes, it says here, it says here that it's cheesecake. Yeah. With a scoop of vanilla ice cream. Yeah. And some strawberries on the side. I'm like, yeah. She goes, I just wanted to know. What exactly is that? Jesus, I don't know, I don't know. So you got me now, like I've been working here two years now and fair play to you for spotting that, like. I'll have to call, call the food and beverage manager or something. Jesus, fair play to you, Jesus, I don't know. Do you know what now, do you know what? I'm gonna give this a go. I have a sneaky feeling I know what this is, right? Now, just hear me out now, all right? I think, right? I think this, I think it's cheesecake. <laughs> With a scoop of vanilla ice cream. <laughs> and some strawberries on the side. And she said, oh, thanks, I just wanted to check. <laughs> then went up to the bar and ordered a coffee. <laughs> you spend a lot of time with people that you work with, don't you? You spend more time with them sometimes than you do your own family or your friends or your partner or stuff like that. And when I was like, doing all my jobs and stuff, I realized like, that's a, it's an important place to be in your work. And it's, it's very hard if you're in a place that you don't like. Right? I have a mate of mine, and he came to me recently. He's getting bullied at work. He's getting bullied at work. Right? Now, my first reaction... Shouldn't have been, Jesus, that's hilarious, can I come in and watch, right? <laughs> Do you ever like work with somebody, no matter where you work, there's always somebody in your office or where you work that always, every time you tell them you've done something, they have always done something better than you. They'll never let you celebrate your own success, you know? This mate of mine, Kevin, he said to me, there's a guy next to me at work, like every time I tell him I'm doing something, he's always done something better. He never lets me... You know, he never talks to me about what I've done. It's always him, 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 him. I said, give me an example. I said to him recently, I said, Kevin, I'm running a 10K at the weekend. He goes, are you? Well, I'm running a half marathon. You know, makes him feel bad. Always has to go to the next level. A couple of weeks later, he said, Kevin, I'm taking the girlfriend to Spain for a week. He goes, are you? Well, I'm taking the wife to Brazil for three weeks. <laughs> always has to go to the next level. He said, Andrew, I don't know what to do. How do I deal with this fella? I said, this is what you do. The next time you see him, tell him you have depression so he'll kill himself, right? <laughs> you get a half day for the funeral, it's a win-win situation. <laughs> Everyone's a winner, baby. I feel very settled as a person. I feel very settled, you know, and it's great because I've had a lot of trauma over the last few years, you know, and uh, coming to Belfast has really helped me, I think. Uh, just being around here, being back on the island, uh, been very, feel very welcome here. Feel, feel people are so nice to me, you know. And I thought about this recently, like, because uh, my mum died, you know, and my mum died a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, living with the trauma and the grief of that every single day, it's really, really difficult. But I think, I, I think about, like, as, as Irish people and stuff like that, if funerals, right, 
We're an Olympic sport. <laughs> we would win gold medal, right? We're the fucking best at funerals, lads, aren't we? Like, we are amazing. I never realized how good we are at funerals as a country, right? Other countries, other cultures, different ways of burying their dead, right? If you're from India and you die in India and you die, like, you are cremated same day, dead. Like, dead, dead. Like, you're super dead. Like, your phone battery has more life than you, right? You are dead. If you die in England, it could be three weeks before you buried them. Three weeks before you buried them. Sure, you'd nearly forget about them, right? I have to pick the kids up. I have to go to yoga. Jesus Christ, I have to bury Steve, right, you know? <laughs> Ireland here, it's three days. It's a stag and a Hindu. It's absolutely perfect timing. What happens is a load of people come together who haven't seen each other for a while. There's lots of alcohol involved. And by the end of it, somebody's missing, right? That's exactly <laughs> how it works, right? My mother died of cancer, right? She was a great woman. I'll never forget it. My mum was a psychiatric nurse for 40 years and she had a great sense of humour, a very dark sense of humour. And when I found out that she had terminal cancer, I was living over in England, I got the phone call. She rang me up to tell me that she had terminal cancer. And I said, right, Matt, do you know what's going to happen? Your number one son's coming home, right? I'm going to look after you in Cork. I'm going to take you to chemo. Gonna, we're going to do everything together. We're going to get through this together. And she said, Andrew, you moving home will be worse than cancer, right? <laughs> Then my brother said, if he's coming home, that's two cancers in the house, like. <laughs> my mother was great crack, man. She used to come up with these mad ideas, right? She was very liberal, very forward thinking, very pro women's rights, which was great and stuff like that. But, but she was also incredibly traditional. And sometimes her forward thinking views and her traditional ways, they never synced. They didn't sync as one good idea. I'll give you an example. My mom believed that gay men in Ireland should be allowed to get married in the Catholic church, right? but one of them has to wear a white dress. Like, that's exactly it. <laughs> Doesn't really work, does it? But you know what, I actually agree with her. I think gay men should be allowed to get married in the place where they work. My mom was great crack, man. She was super, you know. I uh, remember every birthday, every single birthday from the age of 18, 19, I would get the same birthday present, except for the big birthdays, 21 and 30 or something like that. Scratch cards. <laughs> the most Irish mom birthday present you can ever get. When I was living in England, my mom used to send me a card with two all cash scratch cards, Euro scratch cards. She'd ring me up on my birthday. Well, happy birthday. He goes, well, Mammy, you're right. Well, did you get your card and your scratch cards? I goes, I did, Mammy, yeah. Well, did you scratch them? <laughs> I said, I did, Mammy. Well, any luck? I said, I won two euro. <laughs> she goes, well, there you are now. <laughs> you can't put a price on luck. <laughs> you can, it's two euro. <laughs> I said, Ma, you don't realise that I, I live in England and these are euro scratch cards. These are Irish scratch cards, and I'm in England. I can't cash the scratch card in to get me two euro. She goes, well, post them back to me. <laughs> so the cost of the stamp and the admin alone would outweigh the profit gained from the part of it. I tell you, post those fucking things back to me now. <laughs> but she was mad like that, and she, she loved, uh, she taught me loads of things, like, but she was quick and sharp, right? I'll never forget this. We were in London. It was about a year and a half before she passed away. We were in London, and she had cancer at this time. And we... <laughs> It was my brother's birthday, right? And she wanted to buy him socks, right? So we walk into this place just off Bond Street. We walk in, now the classic, you know, I do, and you're right. I'm not, my mother would be like, wouldn't be up for it now at all, right? Like, like, like Jesus, your man's, if Jesus, your man's an awful fucking idiot, like, isn't he? Right? You know, you know the way the Irish are looking your man, hello, how you doing, you're right? My mother's like, well, you can, you can fuck off now. How you doing? You are a lovely day. No, don't be talking to me. About, I'll tell you what a lovely day is now. Don't, a lovely day is when you're not here. I can tell you that. <laughs> Pick up the socks, right? 1995 for three pairs of posh socks. She gives me the socks. She gives me the 20 sterling. I go to the till. I walk up. I was a high man. You're right. Just the socks. How you doing today, guys? You all right? Oh, no, 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 no. I said, listen, the mother, mother's in the background. She's going, yeah, yeah, you keep fucking talking to him. <laughs> No, no, I'm glad you guys. I did just doing a bit of shopping today. Well, obviously, yes, we are. Yeah, it goes, it goes, right, 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 okay. Just the socks, is it? I'm like, yeah, just the socks. Yeah, he goes, right, okay, right. All right, can I just get your postcode? Can I just get your postcode? I'm like, you what? He goes, can I just get your postcode? I said, oh, we're Irish. 
We know everybody. We don't need postcodes. <laughs> we know where everybody lives. We're grand, right? Right, see, so you don't have a postcode. It goes, no, we're Irish, we're tourists, right? Right, okay, have you got an email? Have you got an email? I said, what do you want to email for? We just want to keep in touch. I said, no, 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 we're not, we're not keep, no, we're not keeping in touch now at all. You know, I have enough friends, to be honest with you, right? Because I, I just went, I actually don't have an email. Because it's not against the law to not have an email, right? My mother's in the background, tell him fucking nothing, right? <laughs> He goes, well, I just need something for the system. I said, well, look what I got. I'll tell you what I've got, right? I've got 20 sterling, right? These are 19.95 for three pairs of socks, right? I'm willing to give you the 20 sterling. I don't need a bag and I don't need a receipt. I'll give you the 20 sterling and you give me the socks. This is a very forgettable transaction, okay? He goes, but I just need, I need an email just to keep in touch. Who are you keeping in touch with? Are you keeping in touch with me? Because I'm not the one going to be wearing the socks, right? Are you keeping in touch with the person who's financed the socks, which is my mother over here, right? The person who's using the socks is my brother, or do you want to keep in touch with the socks? Like, I don't understand, right? There's three pairs of socks. They could get split up throughout the year, and then you don't know where they're going to be, right? And my mother's in the background going, I've got an email. She goes, he goes what's that? I love socks at hotmail.com. <laughs> And to watch him type it in. <laughs> My mother spent the last three months of her life living in a hospice, right? Hospices are amazing places. Like, Now, I'd never been to a hospice before. I didn't even know where it was. So I did what any normal person would do was I Googled the hospice, right? Just typed it into Google, find the address of that. And I'm not going to lie, there was over a hundred reviews. Who the fuck? <laughs> is reviewing a hospice. Restaurants, hotels, totally on board. But a fucking hospice. Had a great stay this week, we'll come back next year. You're not coming out, Mary, like I don't understand. The patients, they're not the ones fucking reviewing it. I saw one review up there, my mate John went in for a week, never came out, two stars. I was like, what the hell? Still gave it two stars. <laughs> Turned up to my mother's funeral, hung over. Classic Irish thing to do, isn't it? Pints the night before with the cousins. Everyone's crying and upset. I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm in denial, right? Mass at half past ten on the Monday. We turn up. Church is packed. Me and my brother turn up, hung over. My brother's dressed as a peaky blinder, right? <laughs> Flat cap, pocket watch, Costa coffee, right? Walk into the church, we had great seats. Right. <laughs> uh, who's got Ticketmaster? Who's got Ticketmaster? These are great seats. You've got all two priorities. Yeah. So you walk in, right? I'm dying with a hangover now, right? And I'm uh, sitting down next to my brother and I'm uh, going, right, come here, you. I said, have you got any norepinephrine? Have you? He's like, no, no, no. Have you got any Panadol? I said, why would I have asked you for norepinephrine if I had Panadol? You fucking idiot, like. Your right leg is touching my left leg. Get off me. <laughs> she hated you. I was hung over at my own mother's wedding. Oh. <laughs> hung over at my own mother's wedding. I'm not from West Belfast, lads. Jesus. I said that. I've come out of character so many times. <laughs> she hated you. I got the house. <laughs> I'm at my own mother's funeral, right? And I'm hung over. And I remember just sitting there looking at the coffin, just thinking to myself, Jesus Christ, I wouldn't mind to lie down in there now, in fairness, right? <laughs> You know what, I've been in Belfast two and a half years, man. Like, I spend most of my time doing shows outside of Belfast. I, I don't gig here a lot because I, I do a lot over in the UK and down south and stuff. And uh, it is a great place to live and the people are amazing. I'm a big advocate of the North and I think people have the wrong impression of this place. I think it's a lot better than what people think it is. And I think you've, you know, people are just lovely here. And I decided to stay, the houses are cheap. <laughs> and that's the reason that's, I'll be honest with you. 
But uh, I want to say a big thank you to everybody for coming here tonight. I've had an absolute ball, and uh, I really do appreciate everyone that put their bum on a seat tonight, and you've been a very kind crowd. And uh, listen, keep listening to the podcast, tune into the radio, and I hope next year, if you like me, you like what I do, I'll be back here again with a brand new show in about uh, 12 months' time. Please do come along again, and I hope you've enjoyed it. And watch it out for YouTube. Thank you so much, everybody. Cheers. Thank you.